Hello everybody, it's Libby and Prince Church. Today we're going to be talking about a couple topics I mentioned with Michelle this morning, her radio, her vlog. I want to talk about knowledge versus wisdom. Um, and why we said this morning that they make complimentary bookends. Knowledge is the information that you have learned in life, in your journeys, or in school, whatever. And the concept of knowledge is we call it book smarts. That is, we study, 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 and learn things, and also from experience. Wisdom is taking the information that you learn and learning and starting to understand how it all interconnects with what you need to do in life. Our living, our world is a living classroom. As Michelle says, learning is fundamentally essential. And dead means did not advance, did not even attempt developmental advances. Or, I think that's what it was. Didn't even attempt uh, development or something like that. That's what Michelle said, dead means. Um, what that means is, is that you can have um, all the smarts you want. You could be a walking encyclopedia, but if you don't know how to make use of the information that you have acquired, um, you could find yourself in a very bad state. Wisdom is something that is earned from experience of being on this earth and learning the lessons as you go. That's what life means. Learning is fundamentally essential. So it means that every day in our lives we'll learn new skills and how to apply said skills to everyday living. Now, in all the ages, the elderly have always been respected for the knowledge that they can pass on to their um, the children and the grandchildren. And that's still true to this day. A 13-year-old, for example, has a lot less real-world wisdom than a person who's 73. The 73-year-old has probably been through more experiences where they have to take the good with the bad, make decisions based on the information presented to them. And um, so one of the things that we'd, I'd like to do is try to help you understand what is the difference. Well, being a huge data sponge is great. If I wanted a hard drive that walks around, but if you're going to, but if I need advice, it's not going to be from a giant hard drive that walks around on two legs. It's going to be from a person who has the experience of going through or going through similar issues that I have. And when I, I seek that person, I seek their wisdom, not their knowledge. Their knowledge is a little different. Their knowledge is they can tell you, uh, for example, what the steps are, for example, to apply for food stamps. But that doesn't mean that they're going to tell you if you meet all the qualifications, for example. So if you, or if it's really worth it, that's where wisdom comes in. Wisdom says, okay, yes, this is how you get your food stamps. But honestly, uh, from my experience, that's the key piece. From my experience, uh, it doesn't work out that well, or you don't get very much in the first place. It's not a holy grail of a program to get food stamps. Uh, because the paperwork and everything else. That's an example of wisdom. Or wisdom says that, okay, I've been there, done that, learned this lesson, that lesson. And, um, and that's, that's true for anybody. If you are going to learn something new, if you're going to grow up, if you're going to mature, um, that means learning when to hold them and when to fold them, when to walk away, when to run. Michelle likes to talk about that song from The Gambler because it certainly applies to poker as well as to life. There's so much information in the world today that you can eat. If I was just to sit there and plug my brain into a computer and just dump all the information in my head, I would probably have mental indigestion pretty quick because there's just so much data. But now, a wisdom is where you can take that data and sift it out. Um, take out the pieces that are not of any to you. Save the ones that would make sense to you. And infer 
from the pieces that you have gathered, what is to happen from point A to point B. For example, Michelle was phoning out when she came up here today that the hallway lights are totally turned off. Um, which means the landlady said, well, I'm going to have the boiler man working on the boiler this morning at 11 o'clock. So is it hypothetically possible that the problem with the, the boiler is a lot more significant that they had to turn off the power to, to the landlord's fuse box so they could fix something in the boiler, maybe wiring, maybe plumbing. We don't know. But because Michelle and I have understanding of the way building maintenance is done, we're not assuming that he's not paying his electric bill. Um, it could be the case. So we don't know. It's not, it's not our point to argue about something that's not our business. That's another piece of wisdom. Piece of wisdom also says, knowing when to hold them means when you're going to hold on to the data you gathered, knowing when to sold them, when to throw it away, especially impertinent bits that you don't need, when to walk away, we mean when to walk away with what you got and hope to God that you are doing okay. It means keeping your mouth shut. Which means if you're going to go out there and start trouble, you better know when to run. Um, wisdom is not something, as I said, that is just earned just because you graduated from high school or college. Wisdom is something you earn from real world experience of being in the trenches. You know, along with your fellow mankind and, and dealing with the issues of the world around you. That's wisdom. You can be street smart, which is also a form of wisdom. In fact, I'm surprised Michelle said earlier they don't call it street wisdom. It certainly is street wisdom. When you have no, for example, where you can go get a handout, where you can get a meal, what kind of people to congregate around, what kind of people to avoid congregating around, um, knowing when is when that you know when certain things should be discussed and when things should not be discussed. This is also a form of wisdom. It's important for your survival in the street. And that's one of the things that me and Michelle um, are trying to also do is get ready to um, expand our uh, media goals of expanding in advocacy for the homeless and the poor. Um, that's going to be a whole project in its own right. And that, Michelle, will discuss later on. Yes, I will. Also, of course, Michelle wanted me to remind you that on September 28th, the long-awaited Once Upon a Time will be on TV, ABC Networks at 9 o'clock. There will be a precursor show, if you will, a cliff note to get you up to speed from the information from Season 3 for all those who are going to be new to watching Once Upon a Time so you understand the story. And so that there will be less confusion for those who are coming from um, people who have never seen Once Upon a Time before. This will be your chance to get to know the basic characters, the plot, the stories, and everything so that you can go ahead and have knowledge of what's going to come up. Now, that's knowledge. That's facts and figures, dates. That's not wisdom. Okay, it's a good example of that. Okay, if wisdom would be like, like I said, if now when you know, for example, the story of Once Upon a Time is, you can ask yourself, is what is the likeliness that these characters are going to do this event or that event? I mean, how is the character A going to react to a character B? Um, and if you've been a long time Once Upon a Time watcher, which me and Michelle have not been, no, only watched a few episodes of last season on uh, ABC uh, mobile right so we have clearly we have a lot to learn about the material around us um the the world around us is is bad enough and um and so there's there's so much information out there and sometimes it's very easy to mistakenly screw up and think knowledge is wisdom. Wisdom is earned, it is not given. You don't just go pick up a degree of wisdom. There's no course in it. It's called life, that's it. That's how you learn about wisdom. Um, 
this has been this was a program I was going to do for months, and and I really wanted to work on it, and uh, and so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to uh, inspire and to educate. That's our whole purpose of what Michelle and I are trying to do. Is so that you understand the world around you, especially on the local level. Our Cable 13 project is specifically oriented around the local issues that affect people in Winstead. So we try to keep the locals' micro environment separate from their macro environment. That is, the world events outside of Winstead, Michelle likes to cover on her YouTube channel. Okay? And I like to cover uh, spiritual issues that affect more than just the local microcosm. Um... But the program that Michelle would like to do next is, uh, on Cable 13, is to start discussing the homeless needs and the homeless concerns in life. And that's a pretty great thing. I think it's a great idea. I think we should be very help I'm very thankful that Michelle has taken the time uh, to wanting to reach out and talk to as many people as I can to learn real-world experiments and real-world information and, and to gather data and also help help people to advocate for them and stand up for their needs. That's a wonderful thing, and that should be something that everybody should be trying to do. Sadly enough, there's a lot of people in this world that do not do that, and those people, um, unfortunately, are part of the problem and unfortunately not part of the solution. But, but, on the other hand, there are people in this world who choose because they're afraid of interference that it'd be better not to interfere and leave them people alone. But then those people often are constantly going and saying is, why does no one talk to us? Why does no one really get to understand what's really going on in our circles? We see it. We know it. Why are we not being allowed to talk about it? Why are people not listening to what we got to say? When is there ever going to be a sitcom regarding the homeless? I mean, you don't think that some of the stuff that the homeless, the homeless can be funny? There's a lot of things that happened to the homeless that some people would enjoy the humor of and some people would probably just would roll their eyes up in their heads and go uh, I've seen it all what do you think Michelle? I, um, uh, the homeless population? yeah do you think there would be a sitcom for that? situation comedy for homelessness it's not really um, something you could really make a, uh, a sitcom on because it's not funny it's serious and it's scary and if you happen to be in the middle of it it's not uh, a lot of sense of uh, um, stability in your life so you just tend to get a little bit you know afraid don't know if you're gonna go where you're gonna go from day to day um, so if somebody was to make um, an honest reasonable attempt to maybe a homeless person uh, discussing their journeys and maybe making a slight a light comedy out of the issues in their lives and the lessons that they've learned sure um, but I think that there's a lot of people who might take offense uh, to some of the information that he has or she has to say because it's just not uh, something that the majority of people talk about and we talked about for example um, a, a TV show that did not really run too well on arts and entertainment called uh, Lone Star Lady. Um, did you ever get a chance to see even one episode of it? No, I think the pilot was canned. I don't think the program did very well. Um, probably because it was just a little bit um, more than they wanted to have for a reality program. Right. Now, let's talk about another program that we know and we watch a lot of Hollywood Hillbillies. Um, what's the story with Reels on that? <sighs> Reels has got to get some more taping in. Uh, when Mike's, Michael Control's career had, uh, has been a major, um, upswing in, in uh, success. Um, they're obviously having to squeeze tapings in between all the stuff that he's doing on his, uh, on his tours and things like that. It's a wonderful opportunity. You get a chance to see a family that's more, more blue collar, uh, getting to be presented in a, in, in a, in the medium, which is great. But I'd like to see the gray collars being represented. The gray collars. Well, you got white collars, which is the upper crusties. Yeah. 
the blue collars or the average man and you know man and woman who work in the factories and in, in the streets and um and then um construction fields and other trades why not the gray collars why would you call them gray collars i think of it like the gray friars um oh the gray friars the capuchins yeah in a sense not in a bad way but rather is men and women who have you know fallen into bad times and yet are trying are struggling to find their way um to still reach the deluxe apartment in the sky as it says in the jeffersons it's a real challenge it is a real challenge again this is where wisdom and street smarts come in because um in order to approach many of these people you have to be almost in the same level as them if say for example uh, a major hollywood producer or even even uh, a, a acting or agent like david weintraub was the go-to say a majority of people that i know he trying to say he wants to do a program they'd probably say well you know what you know he's just a rich guy he's he doesn't understand poverty he doesn't understand the poor and I mean, he has he drives a rolls royce for christ's sakes um how can he tell me how, oh i'm afraid he's going to try to tell me where it's at he's going to preach down at me and that's not what they want no what they really rather have is an advocate who's going to speak out and say to them is you know look i've been there i know what you're going through i want to help you but you got to tell me what you need help with i'll see what can do it i think you would be a very wonderful opportunity for you and me to get out there and talk with more of those people we did have a, we did an impromptu radio interview today it was so noisy in that soup kitchen that the you couldn't really hear all the people and i think that uh, i really think we should try to redo it in a more quiet environment yeah it's, it's freaking fun um uh, but tell me what, what do you think would it take to get people to want to watch a documentary on the homeless i i think that the first i'm going to tell you what the homeless would like to say and then um so that maybe it might exp- well, look, there's a lot of myths about homeless people that i think we need to dispel uh one of the first things is is that homeless people are lazy and they don't want to work uh that's a stigma that has hung around us ever since the homeless population existed even our way back at the time of jesus and that's earth it's been a problem even before that it's been a problem it just seems that in the last in the united states it seems like in the last 200 years um we mentioned the victorian era yes we did and we talked about the workhouses yes we did we talked about how there were programs in the old days to give the homeless a skill that they could put to work and and get out of their um you know the, the situation and that a lot of homeless people took advantage of that for a good cause to get themselves in a better position in london and i don't think the workhouse's mentality really took off too much in the united states um i think there was some programs along the same design but i don't think they were they certainly were successful so yeah there was the pine street inn um in boston was one such program that of course it adapted and modified itself over the year, decades and centuries but there was a need for to advocate and to educate but education by itself is not going to help a homeless person find a job because the first thing a homeless person needs is they need uh a person that's going to put them to work um because you can go through i mean I mean, let's say a homeless person can go to to college if they could finance it. If you could finance it, would you find out of an apartment? Well, that's a then that's not the kids twenty two. I mean, if you got an apartment, you need a job, right? You can't get a job if you don't want an apartment either. Yeah, it's, it's, so how do you get how do you get out of the hole? And like I said to Bianca today, I said, well, it's like you know, why don't you give? I mean, you're homeless, you're hungry, you're cold, you're frozen, you want to get out of the hole, and you're asking for a shovel instead of they start filling in the hole. With you in it, burying you alive. That is exactly what the homeless don't need. Uh, our entitlement programs in this country have failed to um, 
get people out of the, the, the rut staring in their lives. And so um, those people are looking for a um, reason to take, uh, to get out of a uh, way, not just a reason. They're looking for a way to get out of that mess. They're looking for a way to become a functional, active part of society, a contributing member. But when the job market is in a slump, especially for blue collar workers, there's just not, and even the blue collar jobs that are still there, they're looking for people who have work history. They're looking for people, for example, in this area, probably be able to find a job as a delivery delivery driver, but you need a driver's license. You need a clean you need a clean alcohol and drug record. You need um, to do so much. And unfortunately enough, once you get into that academic bracket and you're basically sagging and you're falling into the hole and you can't get out, um, it's really difficult. Um because nobody wants to talk to you anymore. It's like now they're just going to take their back and they're going to fill a hole in and you bury you alive. It's the kind of mentality you hear about when people talk about the homeless population. But then again, it hasn't been homeless people who have abused the system in a bad way. Yes, has there been a lot of white collar and blue people who have abused the system in the right way? Yes, uh, it's, it's abuse is rampant among all economic brackets. It doesn't really matter which one you are. It just seems that the will to do got lawyers and and uh, big money and accountants that can get them out of the hole, whereas the blue collars are just barely above able to make sure to keep their house mortgage paid, their taxes paid, and and provide for their food and clothing for their families. That's the difference. And now when you get into the grays, forget it. You're you're way down there. I mean. Now you're really struggling. You may not even be able to get enough money to get yourself a meal. Never mind buying a pack of cigarettes or buying a uh, a bottle of vodka or something. So you really kind of have to try to choose between all the different circumstances. But there are some homeless dogs that are actually happy in that circumstances. This is not the people we're talking about particularly. The ones that are happy in their situation that like living that way. You guys, um, okay... You're not really a concern You're because you want to be there. I'm not going to, I have no problem with you being there, but I just want to say is this, we're talking about your brothers and sisters who are trying to get ahead. They're trying to get out of the hole as society has put them in. And it's really hard to get them to speak because there's so much fear um, for them to speak up. But um, uh, it, it's it's a real blessing when somebody finally says, "Okay, guys, let's let's blow the lid off this thing. Let's let's open up the smelly cesspit of reality of what's going on, how the programs have failed you." That's when you walk away. No, that's when you run. Because the minute you open up the car, it stink is so bad, and the abuse is so rampant that. You can put on all the gas masks you want and change all the filters in your gas masks. It's just going to stink like the worst cesspits. Oh, God. Um, Because there's so much misinformation. And so it's kind of like when a person dropped their cell phone in the cesspit toilet over in China. All of a sudden, the whole community tries to jump into the cesspit to retrieve for her. And then they all die from ammonia buildup. Yeah, it's kind of like that, but I don't really think I'd want to jump in a pit privy to grab a cell phone, um, no matter how viable it is. Um, but yes, that is certainly an apt example. That's the reason why a lot of people don't really want to take the cover off that cesspit. Because they're afraid that once they have to smell the fetid truth, that they're just going to be um, overcome with the fumes. It's just too much to really chew on. Look, I've already been growing up in this environment. I certainly know the smell of the suspect. I've been here a long time doing this. So I'm a little bit more, I've got a strong enough constitution that I'm not afraid to speak up. because, And I can kind of put in some poopery, if you will, and so that at least the will to do won't go... Hey, you, this stinks, man. Oh, man, I can't stand the smell. Oh, I got to get out of here. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. It's true. You got to, 
we got to get the people, homeless people, to got got a voice. We got to let them speak because if they don't, no one's gonna really want to know exactly what's going on. So many people. Well, this happened since the days prior to the Victorian era. Yes, it did. The well-to-do did not know nothing about the, the, the even the grunts in the streets. Some of the philanthropists were in organizations help funding things like workhouses because they did know that there was a reason we had to do something to help the poor disenfranchised. But today, they're saying, sorry, I'm not interested. You go out and find your own support. I'm not worried about making sure my kid has the newest iPhone 6 and iPhone 6 Plus. Ugh. you got to be kidding me. That's the way they think. It's despicable. It's despicable. It's, it's the way they are. It's not the same anymore. But yet you say what we talked about before with the Victorian era is that things are cyclic. Yes, they are because now there's starting to be some people like myself who are realizing that what happened in the Victorian era is happening again. And it's worse because Victorian era, we had a strong taught that there was a moral and a social safety net that must be maintained by people. Today, that safety net is pretty much a thing of the past. It's not really discussed, and people are really getting hurt. And was people, those poor people were asking the same question. They, they go to bed every night. For those of them who have a strong faith system, and they turn their eyes up to the sky, they say, Lord, why me? Why me? Why am I in this situation? I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't drug, I don't have illegitimate children, and I can't get ahead in my life. Why me? Which relates to something we talked about with the Akasha record. It does, Taba, it does relate to that Akasha record. Because you're right, Loom, there's a lot of well to do that actually chose to come back to learn the experience of the well to don't. Well to don't? I like that, it's cute. Well to don't. Um, yeah, you know the ones I'm talking about. Mm-hmm, I sure do. Um, and then they're the ones when they go home, they're going to say is, uh, at the time of their intake, they're going to always, well, what'd you learn? And a lot of them are going to probably say, you know, I did not realize that was hard. I, I, I really was misinformed of what, what I'd be like. And sadly enough, there's still a lot of people down there on earth that are still misinformed. And so, one of the things that I'm going to keep doing is I'm going to be, I'm not afraid to rattle the cage. I will rattle that cage until it breaks the bars off, one by one if I have to. Guys, if you can charge a fabble using BL5C batteries and it takes about four charges to do it, she'll rattle those bars until they fall off. She'll do it. I know Michelle. <laughs> Thanks, so. Um, But anyway, um... So I'm um, going to see if we can try to get that together as a group meeting. I really want to see if we can focus on using and bringing some real insight between wisdom and knowledge. Wisdom, as I said, is how you use your knowledge. It's not just something you can just, um, just carrying basically a mental encyclopedia. Yeah, it'd be like if, if you have, if your wisdom, you're like, you're kind of like you can take the information that you see around you and you can go, gee, okay, um, this circumstance, um, given the circumstance around me, I can see where this isn't going to work or this is going to work. And people who have wisdom are revered or always the elderly. Because, let's be honest, there is a big difference between... Um, um, just having all the smarts in the world and having no common sense. Wisdom is related to common sense. Yes, it is. Um, and also, you know, the, um, you know, just, just the way it is, I guess. Yeah. All right, so we'll see where we're going to go from here, I think. We're gonna, and don't forget, um, me and Michelle will be working on that. And I hope they hear from you also, audience. So please do not forget to like or dislike. Please comment below. Let me know what you want to discuss, if there's any particular topic. I'm always open for your information. And don't forget, like Michelle would say, share with your friends and enemies. Absolutely. And that way they can all be educated. 
So until then, until later on, talk to you soon. Bye-bye, everybody.